uh, Dr. Amanda Podany. And so uh, I'm going to give everyone just a second to breathe uh, before we uh, before we jump into the first keynote here. Um, oh, okay. And uh, uh, Amanda's here. Very good. Okay. All right. So uh, Amanda Podany is a professor emeritus of history at the California State Polytechnic University Pomona. She specializes in the study of Syria and Mesopotamia in the Middle and Late Bronze Age with a particular focus on chronology and social history, and is the author of the forthcoming book, Weavers, Scribes, and Kings, A New History of the Ancient Near East um, through Oxford University Press. She has authored several other books and many articles and is, the, uh, and is the instructor in a series of 24 video and audio lectures for Wondrium, the great courses uh, called Ancient Mesopotamia, Life in the Cradle of Civilization. Uh, and uh, Dr. Potany is going to um, give our first keynote here uh, entitled Looking for Leaders, the People Missing from Mesopotamian Royal Inscriptions, 2500 to 1500 BCE. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Potany, and the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it and um, really delighted to be part of this uh, Congress and um, really interested in the topic in general. I'm going to share my screen and... Uh, just need a second um, need to go to bear with me. All right. So I was really pleased to, to be invited to talk because I've been working on um, looking at people who are not leaders in the book that I'm writing right now, I'm looking at looking not just at the leaders, but also at people who were supporting leadership, um, people who were in positions of power that are kind of missing from many narratives. And uh, so this this fit in really nicely with some of the work that I've been doing. Just a second. There we go. This mace head is inscribed with one of the earliest royal inscriptions in the world. It was commissioned by one of the earliest known kings anywhere, King Mesalim of Kish. He ruled sometime around 2600 BCE during the early dynastic period in Mesopotamia. The mace is shaped into interwoven figures of lions. Across their bodies, the artisan has inscribed what you see there. Mesalim, King of Kish, temple builder for the god Ningirsu, set up this mace for the god Ningirsu. Lugal Shah Engor is the ruler of Lagash. We get just the tiniest glimpse of political history here. Not only was Mesalin the king of Kish, but he constructed a temple for the god Ningirsu, to whom the mace was also dedicated. But there's an interesting postscript to this inscription. He also names another ruler, Lugal Shah Engor, ruler of another city, Lagash. They don't have the same title. Mesalim used the title Lugal, meaning big man in Sumerian, which came to be the standard Sumerian word for king. Lugal Shah Engor was the local leader of Lagash. He had the title of Ensi, which later came to make, mean king in some regions and governor in others. Kish, home to Mesalim, was one of the northernmost of the Sumerian city-states of the early dynastic period. Lagash, he you see circled, home to Lugal Shah Engor, was far to the south and the mace head was found in Lagash. Ningirsu was the city god of Lagash. He was sometimes symbolized by a lion as seen here. So the temple that Mesalim built would have been the main temple in Lagash. This all suggests that in the early dynastic period, although the city-states were often independent of one another, in the 27th century BCE, King Mesalim of Kish was able to, in some way to dominate Lagash. So who was the audience for this inscription? As you can see from the photograph, the um, writing was barely visible. Who could possibly have read it? Fortunately, the gods could read cuneiform, even cramped cuneiform like this, and it was the god Ningirsu who needed to know about Me uh, Mesalim's dedication to him, the temple that he had built, as well as the mace head that he had dedicated. The desire of Mesopotamian kings to record their pious acts for the gods resulted in the creation of innumerable royal inscriptions written over thousands of years, from this mace head to texts written across alabaster walls of the palace of Ashurnasirpal II in the 9th century BCE and beyond, 
they have provided a core framework for the reconstruction of Mesopotamian political history. But royal inscriptions are innately problematic as sources. They are often described as propaganda and some were indeed set up in public or somewhat public spaces, though few people could read. But some were placed where they would never be seen, for example, in a box in the foundation of a building or on the flat side of a brick that was covered by mortar. Only the gods could see these, though the, god, the kings sometimes also noted that a future king might come across the inscription when rebuilding the structure. We can be certain though, that whoever was the intended audience, divine or human, royal inscriptions weren't unbiased. They didn't tell the complete story of events, and obviously they weren't written for the 21st century historians, like us, examining the issue of ancient leadership. We have to look beyond them in order to understand the structures of leadership and to identify the leaders other than kings in ancient Mesopotamia. Writing had developed in Mesopotamia, as I'm sure you know, around 3200 BCE, but for the first six centuries, it had been used in very limited ways, as a memory aid and for recording administrative details and lists of words, and for keeping records of some legal transactions. Its potential for recording narratives or spoken language was not yet realized. It was, however, recognized as a way to communicate over time and space. Scribes must have known that a clay tablet listing the distribution of some barley from a warehouse, as here, could still be understood months or years after it had been written down, and the tablets were indeed kept and presumably consulted for long periods of time. A tablet could also be carried to a different location and understood by a scribe there. Someone who had never seen the original warehouse could know its contents based on this. A tablet could also be sealed. This is the back of that same tablet, which provided more information about who was involved. When kings started commissioning inscriptions to the gods, they were taking advantage of these qualities of writing. An inscription like the one on the mace head would last longer than the king's lifetime and could be read by someone, perhaps the god or another person who might not have been present when it was written. An inscription helped keep the king's memory alive. This worked for thousands of years, for as long as cuneiform was being written and read. But by the first century CE, only a tiny number of people could still read cuneiform. And soon after that, the script was entirely forgotten. Only with the decipherment of cuneiform in the mid 19th century did the world rediscover the ancient Mesopotamian kings. But the story we tell now about these kings isn't exactly the one they commissioned. The, the next leader of Lagash to send messages to the gods seems to have been King Ornanshe, who ruled in the mid third millennium BCE, probably in the 20, uh, 2500s. This stone plaque is well known. It includes 13 figures, most of whom have cuneiform captions to identify who they are, along with a few lines to the gods. The captions include the names of three officials, seven sons of the king, including the crown prince, Akurgal, and a daughter, Abda. King Ornanshe himself appears twice, much larger than anyone else. On the left, he has a basket on his head, and on the right, he is seated with a cup in his hand. There's no mistaking that he's the most important person here. Curiously though, his daughter Abda is the second largest figure. The crown prince Akurgal stands behind her. One gets the sense that his daughter may have had some importance, though the accompanying inscription doesn't elaborate on what that might have been. As you can see, Ornanche starts his inscription with the name of his father, and he goes on to list three structures that he had constructed to the gods. Like Meselem before him, he claimed to have built the temple of the local god in Ingirsu. He had probably perhaps rebuilt or refurbished it. And he also built two other structures. Throughout Mesopotamian history for another 2000 years, royal inscriptions were very often written to commemorate the construction of temples or the dedication of items in those temples. The kings wanted to remind the gods of their actions and so that the gods would never forget the king's piety. Ornanche's last claim here is interesting because it doesn't pertain to the gods. He refers to this, these ships of Dilmun submitting timber as tribute from the foreign lands to Lagash. Now Dilmun was far to the south of Mesopotamia across the Gulf in what is now Bahrain. It's unlikely that the timber sent from there was actually tribute. Dilmun wasn't controlled by Lagash at this time. The timber was more likely to have represented one side of an exchange of luxury goods for which Ornanche had in turn sent valuable items from Lagash. This type of diplomatic interaction 
was also a feature of ancient Middle Eastern history for thousands of years afterwards. Royal women were portrayed on another of Arnanchi's inscriptions. The captions on the figures here show that the seated person on the bottom right was his wife, Min Bara Absu, and the seated person on the bottom left was his daughter, Nin Usu. His sons don't appear on this delay. He mentioned the ships from Dilmun here again, as he did on at least seven different inscriptions. The diplomatic or perhaps trade connection with Dilmun was clearly an achievement of which he was proud. Now, in spite of some images of his wife, his daughters, sons, his officials appearing on these steles, Ornanche's many known inscriptions don't mention any other person in Lagash actually doing anything. It was the king alone who built all the temples, shrines, gates, and monuments, and these make up the majority of the achievements that he listed. It was the king who brought the Dilmun ships. It was him who dug the canals and the, oak and the reservoirs. He created the statues. He fought the enemy cities, captured enemy leaders, and performed oracles to select a priest, and he distributed barley. From this period onwards, for 2,000 years, these were the basic building blocks of royal inscriptions in Mesopotamia. The king did everything himself, according to his own account. He did it all for the gods, and he wrote about it to let the gods know. Even the categories of achievements stayed pretty much the same. Buildings, water projects, statues, warfare, providing for the people, and appointment of priests and priestesses, though kings varied in the amounts that they emphasized each category. For over a hundred years, kings of Lagash after Ornanche continued to commission inscriptions, and they continued to direct these inscriptions to the gods, as on this statue of King Enmatena from around 2450 BCE. In this section of what is a very long text, and you can see how long it is from the autograph copy on the right, um, in the, within that, that long text, he mentions the original location of the statue. He wrote, at that time, Enmatena fashioned a statue of himself, named it Enmatena is the beloved of the god Enlil, and set it up before the god Enlil in the temple. He also acknowledged why it had been made. Enmatena, who built the Ayada temple, made his personal god, the god Shul'utl, forever pray to the god Enlil for the sake of Enmatena. This statue had the power to pray to the gods for their constant support. To Mesopotamian eyes, Statues held part of the life force of the person, and this statue not only prayed on behalf of Enmatena, but also received offerings to him, even after his death. Royal inscriptions in the early dynastic period were generally written on stone or metal objects, or on bricks or baked clay cones. These inorganic materials have survived well in the ground. In many other ancient cultures, at least in the Mediterranean region, royal inscriptions can be found on the same types of media. Think, for example, of the stone inscriptions of Egyptian kings or of Roman emperors. Documents that were meant to last lend themselves to being carved in stone or on metal. But the writing medium for daily use in many ancient cultures was ink on an organic material, papyrus or leather, and later parchment or paper. Almost all of these quotidian documents have disintegrated or carbonized over the subsequent millennia like for example, the papyrus from Herculaneum in the top left of this slide. A few ancient uh, texts escaped oblivion because they were either found in the desert, like the Hekanak letter, which is the, um, in the center of the top row in this slide, or in anaerobic conditions. And the um, top right, you see the letters from, from um, Vindolanda, the Vindolanda letters that were found in Britain near Hadrian's Wall that survived because of the anaerobic um, conditions in which they were found. But more often, things, uh, ancient texts that were not sort of inscribed for the future are found because they were written in ink on, for example, uh, pottery sherds, or like on the left, or on pieces of limestone. And in China, um, some inscriptions were written on bone as well, and those also survived, like the one on the bottom right. Now, fortunately for Mesopotamian scholars, um, vastly more documents have survived. And this is of course, because they wrote on clay. The clay tablets that recall these mundane details of everyday life have been excavated in vast numbers. There are more than half a million that have been found to date and hundreds of thousands more probably are yet to be uncovered. They allow us to study the world of individuals in many different walks of life. And with, with regard to the topic of this conference, they provide a rich view of the way that leadership functioned. 
So let me give you an example. This is another king of Lagash, a king named Lugalanda, and he ruled around 2400 BCE. He had a fairly short reign, and unlike Enmatena, he didn't leave us a statue, or rather we have not yet found the statue that he um, made of himself, although we know it did in fact exist. And we also have not found any inscriptions on stone. Again, they may well exist and not have it been found. We do have his impressive cylinder seal seen here, um, but it includes nothing more than his uh, name and title. And as you can see there, it gives his full name, which was Lugalanda Nkonga. There's also a short brick inscription, and this is the only royal inscription that we know of of Lugalanda. It says, Lugalanda, ruler of Lagash, chosen in her heart by the goddess Nanshe, granted the exalted scepter by Ningirsu, son born by Baba, and then there's a break, as you can see. It says, son of an Antarzi, ruler of Lagash, for the master who loves him, Ningirsu, he erected a monument and named it Ningirsu is the Lord eternally exalted in Nippur. He fashioned his own statue and named it Lugal Nuhanga, never ceases in his efforts for the Girnun. So this is pretty standard stuff. He was chosen by the gods, son of the previous king, devoted to Ningirsu, to whom he dedicated a monument, and he created a statue of himself. Fortunately, though, a huge number of administrative texts come from his reign, and they were found during the excavations in the ancient city of Girsu, which was the capital of Lagash. This one is a label on a basket of administrative texts. But although it names Lugalanda, it came from the archives of his wife, Bara Nantara. And she proves to have been much more influential than one would ever guess if you only had the royal inscriptions uh, to judge from. In fact, this was true of um, queens of Lagash in general. They seem to have, been, have had significant power in the kingdom. But they were almost never mentioned in the royal inscriptions at all, aside from those first images of the queens of the queen, of uh, Onanche's queen, they don't get mentioned by the kings in their inscriptions. So what do we know about Queen Bara Nantara? Well, she had this very impressive seal, and here you see an impression of it. It was at least as impressive as her husband's, perhaps even more so. It's a very large seal, it has three registers, and the top and bottom ones show a heroic figure controlling rearing animals. And this was an image that was reserved for powerful people. And this inscription on it um, that identifies her, but tells us nothing more than that she was the wife of Lugalanda, the ruler of Lagash. But as I say, hundreds of administrative texts have been found in her palace at Girsu. And the, her palace was called the A Mi, which means the House of Women. And on the website of CDLI, which is the Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative, you can find about 800 of these tablets. Um, many of them have images like this one that I got from the CDLI webpage, and many of them also have translations. A few even have translations as well. And they've been analyzed by many scholars over the years. And so we know in fact much more about Bara Namtara than we know about her husband, King Lugalanda. And it turns out from what we've uh, found that she was a leader in her own right, and that this was common for the Queens of Lagash. And one would have never guessed that from royal inscriptions. Bara Namtara took over as the head of the Aimi only after her mother-in-law had died. As in many times and places across the ancient Middle East, the role of the queen didn't end with the death of her husband. She kept her position until her own death. Only then did the wife of the reigning king take over her responsibilities. Now the Aimi was not just a palace. It was a huge economic institution controlling more than 4,465 hectares of land and the barley, dates, and other crops that they produced. It also maintained the canals in these regions, along with fisheries and vast herds of sheep, goats, cattle, and pigs. Bara Namtara was at the head of this, and she was personally involved in its administration. She oversaw a workforce of about 700 people whose names and payments were listed on the administrative texts found in her palace. A large number of workers named on these tablets worked in textile manufacturing, and the vast majority of these workers were women. It's been possible for researchers, and I want to note that this work has largely been done, notably been done, by Rosemary Prentice, Fumi uh, Karahashi, and Agnes Garcia Ventura, and so I'm, I'm recall, uh, describing their work here, and they have traced the careers of individual women who served as supervisors of textile workshops in the palace. 
And this um, cylinder seal shows these three textile workers around a horizontal loom. I mentioned this just to give you a sense of just the depth of information that one can get from these administrative texts to the point where you can actually look at individual um, workers and how they uh, progress through their careers. Baranantara also had other responsibilities. As I mentioned, King Ornanshe had boasted about those boats from Dilmun that had brought him timber and that that was probably representing a diplomatic alliance. Well, in the time of Baron Antara, we know this was diplomacy because she had diplomatic relations with other queens and she had an alliance represented on this tablet um, or recorded on this tablet with a queen named Nin Gishkimti of the land of Adal. And that was upriver from Lagash. And they exchanged gifts and their envoys traveled regularly between their courts. And here you can see, this is the text of that um, same uh, tablet that I just showed you. And what you can see is that at the beginning, it starts with gifts that the queen of Adab sent to Baron Amtara, and she lists 10 jennies, one box with footstool, one small box with figurine, and one small ivory figurine. And then it mentions that uh, these had been brought um, by a, a man uh, who worked for her. And then it says that Nin Gishkemti gave to Malgasu, and this was the, um, the envoy from Adab, she gave him one pair of exquisite garments. And then it says that Baranantara in exchange um, sent goods to the queen of Ada. And there she lists 120 minas of copper and five minas of tin and bronze. So this is a classic gift exchange, luxury gift exchange between royalty. There's more evidence later on in Mesopotamian history for this taking place between kings, but clearly in the early dynastic period, this is a diplomatic relationship between queens. And at the end, it says that Baron Antara gave to the um, envoy from Adab, um, she gave him two garments and a flask of scented oil. So what we see here then is that this is the, one of the first examples of luxury gift exchange between rulers but that this continued then for more than a thousand years. Baranantara's rule also extended to religious rites. She had a central role in a festival called the Festival of Eating Malt of the Goddess Nanshe. And the text records her actions as she traveled around the major cities in the kingdom of Lagash over an eight day period, dedicating offerings to the gods and to past kings and queens of Lagash. A record was even kept of Bara Namtara's elaborate funeral, which took place over two days and involved 92 lamentation priests who would have performed music and they would have sung and they were paid in bread and beer. So when looking for royal leaders, you can see that royal inscriptions are just the tip of the iceberg. In Lagash, the Queens took a huge role. And the same was true in the same century, the 25th century BC, but in Ebla, far to the Northwest of Lagash. You see Ebla circled on the map here. The palace at Ebla included no royal inscriptions that have been found, so we don't know what the kings would have said about themselves, but the archive that was found in the palace, seen here during excavation, contained thousands of administrative texts on clay tablets, and as at Lagash, they record an intensive industry in textiles that was controlled by the palace. They also reflect a network of diplomatic relationships, that were reinforced by treaties in which um, the kings swore oaths. Uh, they had envoys, they exchanged in luxury gift exchange, and they also had an antagonistic relationship with a neighboring kingdom. This was also true in Lagash. Lagash had had a long standing war with the neighboring kingdom of Uma, and in the case of Ebla, there was a long standing battle going on with the neighboring kingdom of Mari. But the tablets also show that the king in Ebla, as in, in the case of the king of Lagash, was far from being the sole source of authority. One partner of the king in leading the kingdom was the vizier, but he had, his title was actually written with the Sumerian sign Lugal, which in Sumer meant king, but in this case, it seems to have reflected his role as a vizier. This was a man who was a military leader. He was the king's right-hand man, frequently mentioned in administrative documents, but there were also, besides the vizier and the king, a group of people known as the elders who advised the king. And perhaps the most important person next to the king in Avla was his wife, the queen whose, whose title was the Maliktum, 
And here's a reconstruction. Um, it was proposed by Paolo Mattia, the uh, excavator at Ebla, of a standard that was found in Ebla, it would have been mounted on a pole, and it was found in pieces. On the right is an image of the living queen. On the left, there's a smaller figure that was perhaps the statue of her predecessor, and that she was paying homage to her predecessor with an altar in between them. In both Ebla and Lagash, we know that statues of former queens were indeed provided with offerings. So administrative records and ritual texts from Ebla show that the king and queen were perceived as a ruling couple sharing authority. I'm gonna speed ahead in time um, to the 18th century BCE to give you another case study of a king who is well known and who also was supported by a leadership uh, network rather than actually achieving all of his achievements himself. He was 700 years after the kings of Lagash, and this is Hammurabi of Babylon. Now, when Hammur Hammurabi um, came to the throne, his kingdom didn't extend far beyond uh, the region of Babylon. But over the course of his 43-year reign, and especially in the last 13 years, he expanded it through conquest so that his empire eventually extended from the Gulf all the way to the city of Mari on the Euphrates. He's shown here at the top of the stele, very familiar image, I'm sure. He's on the left, he's got his hand raised in prayer, and he's standing in front of the statue of the um, sun god Shamash, and the sun god um, oversaw justice. In his royal inscriptions, and this includes the prologue to the laws that were written on the stele, Hammurabi emphasized many of the same types of achievements that were familiar from the inscriptions of the early dynastic kings of Lagash. He claimed to have been chosen and supported by the gods, he embellished and built temples, he provided water for irrigation, and he expanded agricultural land. He conquered enemies at the command of the gods and with divine help. He performed religious rituals and made offerings. He protected and guided his subjects. He was entirely responsible for everything. He mentions no one, from Babylon at least, who had assisted him or who had actually carried out his many projects. Another type of royal inscription, in a way, was the year name. And year names were ubiquitous. For hundreds of years, each king chose a name for every year based on one of his recent great deeds. Throughout the year, scribes used these year names whenever they recorded the date on a text. These provided a way for the king to broadcast his achievements throughout his realm. If you wanted to refer to a date when something happened, you couldn't help mentioning the king and his, his uh, latest achievement. <laughs> You'll not be surprised to know that in the 43 year names of Hammurabi, he doesn't mention a single other Babylonian name besides his own. So again, he's taking credit in the eyes of the gods, at least for everything that he did. Scribes compiled these year names um, into uh, lists like the one shown here to help them keep track of the sequence in which the years took place. And by year 30, Hammurabi was composing these year names that were so long, they're sort of mini royal inscriptions on their own. And as you can imagine, with one this long, um, the scribes would abbreviate them so that they didn't have to write the entire thing every time they listed the date. A limestone stele here um, is also written by Hammurabi. And here you can see how often Hammurabi used the first person. So here it starts, I dug the canal called Hammurabi as the abundance of the people, which abun brings abundant water to the land of Sumer and Akkad. I turned both its banks into cultivated areas. I kept heaping up piles of grain and it goes on and on. I did this and I did this and I did this. Whereas the earlier kings had often used the third person and would say, or Nanche did something or Enmetena did something. Hammurabi often used the first person. So how do we find other leaders in his time behind all of these claims that Hammurabi did everything? Obviously he did not dig the canal himself. He didn't organize the workforce to do so. He needed administrators to help him in every one of the things that he boasted about. Again, clay tablets come to our rescue. Um, they were not written for the future. They were just written for the everyday purpose of keeping the kingdom running. And they provide the real story. During his reign, Hammurabi wrote letters to his officials and hundreds of them survive. And just like the administrative text from Lagash, they reveal a much more complex situation than the one that you would guess from the royal inscriptions alone. His surviving correspondence includes a corpus of about 350 letters, like this one, that he wrote to official, an official 
um, who worked in the province of, uh, of uh, Larsa. And this was a man named Shamash Hazir. And he oversaw agricultural land that belonged to the state. He also oversaw walk, work on the irrigation system. And he um, was responsible for hiring people to uh, share sheep. He had a lot of responsibilities within the uh, region of Larsa. And like the administrative text, um, we see through these letters then that Shamash Hazir played a very important role in Hammurabi's uh, era, and so did many other administrators. So for example, we have an, um, a letter written to Shamash Hazir by Hammurabi, and we see from it that Hammurabi was surprisingly engaged in what might seem to be rather minor details of Shamash Hazir's work. So here he wrote, Sin Ishmayani, the date gardener, brought this to my attention. Shamash Hazir has appropriated land of my family's estate and has given it to a soldier. Is perpetual land ever to be taken away? Return the field to him. Hammurabi must have received letters from people across his realm, like this date gardener mentioned here. And he personally, in many cases, addressed their complaints by sending them on to the administrators who could deal with them. And he kept in touch with a network of high officials across his realm, who in turn oversaw the work of others, and all of them recorded these interactions and listed their, uh, the workmen on clay tablets. And so we have both the letters from Hammurabi, but they would have also kept track of all the people that they were hiring. And again, this leaves um, a paper trail or a clay trail of these leaders and their, and their work. I should note also that queens no longer held quite the authority that they had had in the early dynastic period, but they had a responsibility in a different way now because kings often married foreign princesses. And they did this in order to cement alliances. They would often marry the daughter of their, of perhaps a, a, an, an ally. And these women had a different kind of power because they wrote letters sometimes to their fathers, to keep them apprised of events in their husband's kingdom. And so these women were functioning in a way almost as spies for their father in the region where they had married. And here, for example, is a section from a letter written by a princess to her father, Zimri Lim. And Zimri Lim was the king of Mari. He was a contemporary of Hammurabi's. And his daughter, Inbatum, wrote this letter. Apparently, Zimri Lim had written to Imbatum asking her something about what was going on in her husband's kingdom, and she wrote this back. She wrote, for many years, the city of Amaz was following the lead of the land of my lord, and there she means her husband. And as that city separated from the side of my lord, again, my, her husband, your servant, and that's her father's servant, went and returned that city to the city of my lord and subdued that land. When my lord, again, her husband, has come back, you and he talk among yourselves. So she's, she's filling in Zimri Lim on what had been going on within um, her husband's kingdom. And there's plenty of other examples like this. And clearly she was a useful asset in a way to her father because by living in the husband's court and sending messengers and letters back to her, her father, she was able to keep him informed and her correspondence was separate from that of her husband. So we see then that the Mesopotamian kings wanted the gods to believe that they ran their kingdoms single-handedly. They were men with almost superhuman power to do so many things. But the daily activities of the scribes reveal the truth. Because the Mesopotamians wrote on clay tablets, even the most prosaic records often survive in the ground. They show that from the first early dynastic kings to the time of Hammurabi and long after, each king was supported by an extensive network of men and women in positions of leadership who were responsible for organizing and implementing the great achievements claimed by the kings in their inscriptions. If it were not for the survival of these quotidian texts, we would have no way to know of Baranamtara, Shamash Hazir, Inbatum, or a host of other individuals, men and women, who were leaders in their own right. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Padani, for that amazing talk and solid uh, images and maps, beautiful stuff. The, the comments are exploding with gratitude um, for the, the level of detail uh, in these, uh, these pictures and in this talk. Uh, so again, thank you so much. We do have a few questions from 
the uh, from the, the live stream here. So, uh, and I'll try and get to get to all of them here. Uh, one question question from Christina Donnelly. Uh, With your research, do you think it is fair to say that in the early dynastic period, the epigraph uh, um, wife of does not denote subordinate role, but is rather used um, to justify a, a familial relationship? That's a really good question. One really does have the sense that it was, I mean, it was a patriarchal society, obviously, in the early dynastic period as well. But one doesn't really get the sense that these women were subordinate to their husbands. It's really striking, in fact, in Baranam Tara's archive, how rarely Lugalanda is ever mentioned. It's not that she had to get his authorization for things. She was running her estate on her own. And I think that's, that's a good point that um, wife of, I mean, she was only in that position because she was married to Baranam Tara. I mean, Baranam Tara was married um, to, to Lugalanda. So she had not inherited the throne herself. But having married him, she did have a tremendous amount of authority. And I think you're right that it is not seen, the term wife at that point wouldn't have had that um, subordinate uh, connotation. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so I guess um, wife uh, equals queen at that point. And yeah. so it's it's therefore like a higher title. Well, they had a term for queen as well. Um, and so it's, it's, and it's complicated with Sumerian terms too. Actually, Sumerian is fascinating for this because one of the striking things about Sumerian names is that they didn't have, a lot of names were androgynous so that men and women both had the same name. And sometimes you have to just look very carefully to see was this a woman or a man. And I suspect that a number of figures who we have just assumed were men may have been women because oh. their names were not you know, distinct in terms of, of what the gender was. Wow, that's really fascinating. Um, so we have another question uh, from uh, L LHM who asks, uh, says, thanks Dr. Amanda Podney for this amazing presentation. Are there any other evidences of queenship in Southern Iraq other than Lagash? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, obviously there's the queen of Adab, there's the queen of Dilmun that corresponded with the queen of Lagash. There are, in the early dynastic period, the best evidence comes from, from Girsu, from the, the, um, the excavations there. I'm sure there are, off the top of my head, I haven't been writing about them, and so everything that's in my brain at the moment is, is the things that I've been writing about in my book. Um, there, isn't, it, there isn't an archive that size from any other early dynastic uh, kingdom that reflects the queens, but I suspect, I mean, it certainly seems as though this was the norm, given that it was just such a comfortable relation between the queen of Adab and the queen of Lagash and the queen of Dilmun, that they weren't ruling. I didn't want to suggest they were in charge. They weren't, the kings were. But these queens certainly had an enormous area of um, control, their own estate, this huge estate, and this very interesting diplomatic relationship that doesn't even mention the kings, that I do think signifies that they had, um, it's just they weren't looked at as, as people who were in any way insignificant. They were certainly, not independent rulers, but, but had tremendous power. Great. Uh, turning now to, uh, to cuneiform, okay. uh, one, one question from, from Queso Negro uh, on YouTube asks, uh, did they have standardized dimensions and formats for tablets or did it vary from scribe to scribe in terms of uh, the size or, or like the, the style of the cuneiform? Yeah. yeah, no, that's really good. They were very good at fitting the, the cuneiform into the size of tablet. And so often it looks as though they kind of had figured out ahead of time about how big of a tablet they would need. And then they would make the tablet the size and then they would uh, the, make the little squares, you know, if it was the dynastic period or the lines, if it was the old Babylonian period and fit the text into the amount of space. But that means that some tablets are tiny. So for example, in the old Babylonian period, you can find letters that are like the size of a postage stamp and the entire personal letter is written on them. And then from Ebla, you have these really big tablets that are um, summaries of administrative, almost like a ledger in a way, keeping track of, of um, rations, for example, over a long period of time. And those were, those were much bigger. 
And so it really varied depending on the use the tablet was going to be put to and the amount the scribe was trying to get written on it. Sometimes they've written the most unbelievably tiny script too. If you haven't seen a cuneiform tablet, go and see, you know, see, they're, they're all over the country in museums. Just go and have a look at them and you'd be amazed at the beauty of the script and how small it can be. Great. And uh, there's also a lot of uh, curiosity uh, in the chat regarding this festival of the eating of the barley. Can you tell us more? Well, this was, they had a number of different festivals at Lagash. And the festivals took place throughout the year and they were, they had these esoteric sounding names. So this was apparently the, the time at which the, the statue of the goddess Nanshe um, was given malt, but it, it happened to be the biggest event of the year in Lagash. And these festivals functioned in a number of different ways. One was that they provided an opportunity for the people to actually see the goddess or the god in that the statue would be brought out of the temple and paraded through the city. We know this was true later, it was almost certainly true at this time as well, where this was, it was not a congregational religion, they didn't go to sort of church or temple, they would um, practice their religion very privately, but the big temples to the city gods were off limits for the population, and that's where the god lived in their statue. And so you would have the statue brought out into the public, walk, paraded through the town. But the other thing it did it provided weekends in a way they didn't have a weekend they didn't have a day off work so a festival was a day when everybody didn't work so it provided a break from work. Um, before the invention of the weekend and importantly, the royal family members would go around the kingdom visiting different shrines on the occasions of some of these festivals and Baran Antara going to these three major cities in the kingdom of Lagash is physically being there as a representative of the, the royal family. Um, and she did a lot of these. And I think, and we know this was true also in Ebla, where the queens would go out and perform the rituals. And these were offerings made to the goddess in the different cities. And it, it was a way, I think, of tying the city, the, the city state together, but also of um, physically being there. You know, if you think about the ancient world, the kings were in their palaces, the queens were in their palaces, you didn't see them. You didn't have you know, CNN broadcasting it every night, showing you what your king looked like. And so when they physically showed up, that was a way for the people to sort of be reminded, this is the person who is in charge. This is the person to whom we pay our taxes. You know, that I think it was a, a form of propaganda as well as being a religious ritual to um, appease the gods. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It makes me think of, um like a, a Roman triumph or something like you would you would show up and and you were there to be seen uh and yeah, yeah it's 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 and not an insignificant seen, moment right even when they're traveling through the countryside obviously the queen's not going to be traveling quietly you know trying to hide she's going to have a big procession she's right. going to have lots of attendance she's going to really you know you could just leave your village and go out and see the royal procession go by even if you're not in one of those major cities so I do think it's it's a um uh, a way of, um, of being present, yes, absolutely. Great, and uh, I think we'll give the, the final question uh, now to Barbara, uh, a presenter from our earlier panel. Uh, she says, uh, uh, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. I'd like to know if there is a hypothesis as to why ruling women were missing uh, from some royal inscriptions. Uh, were men trying to diminish their power? That's such an interesting question. Yeah, they were completely missing other than Ornanche's images of his wife in the, or in the Lagash ones. I don't think, you know, I've, I've toyed with that idea. I don't think so. I think what the king was trying to do was to remind the gods of his piety. I don't think it was necessarily a conscious effort to say the queen didn't do anything. Um, it wasn't even a conscious effort to say, you know, even though I'm saying he, he emphasized, I did this, I did that. I think it's more about his relationship to the gods. He's not compelled to bring anyone else into that relationship. He doesn't have to say, oh yes, and my wife too. Oh, and my vizier. Oh, and that's what I did as well. You know, he's saying, I did this for you because I am the king and I represent you and you chose me. So I think it's more a question of what royal inscriptions did is, and, and perhaps that's the, the point I was trying to make at the beginning. They weren't writing for us. They weren't saying this is our political history. We use them for political history because that's what we have. But they were written as a sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship between king and God. And the king was telling the God he'd done these things and asking the God for his support. And so I think that it would, 
it's not that surprising that they don't mention the other people. But I think what's so interesting is getting to see what those other people were doing through these texts that were never intended to last. And that makes for a really interesting um, study. Great. Yes, that's a perfect way to, to finish this excellent presentation. And thank you so much to the audience for your questions. Uh, thank you again to, to Dr. Padani for, um, for joining us today. And here's another virtual clap for, for everyone. Um, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. And thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so of much. Of course.